Alright, hey, welcome to Adventures Among Ideas, available on video and in audio, postca- uh, audio podcast form. So, today we're talking about John Dewey. John Dewey can be a, well, he can be a tough nut to crack, and I find him to be especially difficult when dealing with psychology and psychological issues, but I do think Dewey's um, psychological writings are very useful to know. They develop... Well, for various reasons, they develop on uh, William James's work on psychology. Um, they basically take James's ideas, his basic ideas, from his principles of psychology and try to refine them, make them more rigorous, make them more, even more naturalistic, uh, physicalist, more embodied. So today, for these are some of the reasons why I think it's important to try to grapple with his psychological writings, even though they're very difficult. Um, so today I want to focus on a paper from Dewey's middle period, uh, sort of the middle section of his career, called What Are States of Mind? This uh, particular essay was given as an address in New York um, to the New York Philosophical Club in 1912. Uh, and I guess someone uh, kept a copy of the paper and put it in the um, library, and it was, I guess, found after he died and published. So kind of a posthumous paper, a paper that wasn't really published, but it was a, you know, a talk that he gave. And even though it was a talk, it's still very, <clears throat> still very difficult to read. Um, I'm sure if I heard it, I would understand almost nothing, but at least we have a written form we can kind of uh, ponder. So I think this paper is important because it combines Dewey's transactional theory of emotions, which he had developed earlier in the 1890s, uh, combines this with the, the social theory that had been developed especially by Dewey's friend, George Herbert Mead. And there was a close connection between their theories and uh, kind of took over different pieces from each other. And uh, uh, G.H. Mead, I think, developed the kind of social aspect of uh, kind of this transactional kind of theory earlier and um, influenced Dewey a lot and they influenced each other anyway. So it combines kind of these two things, this um, the theory of emotions that Dewey had earlier been developing through his um, interpretation of William James and then this more social interest that began um, building up in like the first and second decades of the 20th century. So in the 1890s, Dewey had been uh, studying William James's The Principles of Psychology, the, one of the very famous um, psycho, uh, books on psychology. And he was trying to reconcile this with Charles Darwin's The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals, which uh, was published in 1872, one of Darwin's follow-ups to um, On the Origin of Species. And so he was trying to reconcile both of these with each other and also with his own Hegelianism. So Dewey was very much uh, influenced by Hegel in his early, the early part of his career. And he always had this kind of Hegelian aspect to his philosophy, which is where this transactionalism uh, comes from, which I'll kind of be introducing a little bit today or discussing in some ways, uh, but not really giving a thorough treatment. So anyway, state of mind is a a common expression, of course, you must have heard, but um, it had also been used by Darwin in his book and by James in his his book. So I think Dewey had uh, these references in mind when he was uh, discussing states of mind as the topic of his paper. He was referring back, I think, to um, Darwin and James and his work on Darwin and James. So Dewey's theory of emotions in the 1890s did not have much to say about society and how we come to distinguish emotions from one another and distinguish how we distinguish emotions from the objects that seem to cause the emotions. So he didn't really touch on this very much in the 1890s. Um, But the 1912 paper, this uh, What Are States of Mind paper, basically summarizes his, his theory of emotions but kind of brings it up to date by bringing in these um, social factors. He brings um, this theory of emotions and uh, kind of recasts it in relation to um, social factors, which he had been um, thinking about more recently. So how do we come to be aware of our own states of mind? How do we distinguish the subjective from the objective? He's going to see social forces at work in answering these questions. So by a state of mind, what is a state of mind? So by state of mind, Dewey means basically anything that is usually considered a psychic or a mental state. 
an emotion, for example, or a sensation, or an idea, an image, and so on. You know, thinking of a mental image, not an image you see out in the world. So he defines a state of mind as uh, an essentially emotional attitude or disposition. An essentially emotional attitude or disposition. So this is a, a state of mind. And this attitude comes about through the organism's attempt to adjust to its environment. So our attitudes come into play as we are trying to adjust to what's going on around us in our environments. The efforts, so the efforts of the organism to adjust, um, these efforts reverberate through the organism. And this is an image that James had used, this idea of the organism as a kind of sounding board and changes reverberate through the uh, organism. This come, uh, He talks about this in the, prin uh, the Principles of Psychology, and Dewey takes up this image as well. There's a lot of this kind of reverber reverberation talk and re repercussiating and words that I'm not sure are even real words, but Dewey's got all these um, kind of colorful ways to describe this. Um, but this reverberation, this reverberation of the effort to adjust to your environment is the organism's state of mind. And this can be hard to understand, and it's uh, maybe even harder to understand if you haven't read Dewey's writings on emotion from the 1890s. So I'll briefly mention a couple of key points here. Um, so the common sense theory of emotions, which is the theory used by Darwin, says that we perceive something we have an emotion about that thing, whatever it is, if it's interesting, exciting, or whatever, we see it. We have some kind of emotional response to it, and then we act on the basis of this emotion. Uh, William James made a change to this in what came to be called the James Lange theory of emotion, uh, named in part for after the, um, the Danish physician Carl Lange, Lange, I don't know how to pronounce his name exactly, who came up with a similar theory around the same time as James. So in James's theory, we, we respond organically, like in terms of our body, um, like our bodily systems. So we respond organically and behaviorally to our perceptions, to what we perceive. And what we call an emotion is just a part of that response. In other words, emotions uh, don't mediate between perceptions and actions, as in the common sense theory, you kind of have emotions in the middle between the perception and the action. But in James's theory, emotions don't have this mediating role. They're the feeling of bodily changes and of our actions, the feeling that comes from changes to our body as we are perceiving and as we are acting. Uh, the character caricatured version of this is that we see a bear, we run away, and we feel afraid because we ran away. We don't see a bear, feel afraid, then run away. Kind of in the um, kind of the comic book version of this, we um, see a bear, run away from the bear, and because we ran away, we feel afraid. That's not exactly, that's not the, the nuanced version that James gives, but that's kind of the, again, the, um, the sketch version of it. Uh, yeah, so Dewey, uh, Dewey, Let's get his uh, have trouble pronouncing his name, especially when I'm talking about James. So Dewey, uh, John Dewey, takes up the Jamesian version of emotion, um, but he's not quite happy with some of James's formulations. Uh, so for Dewey, to see a bear is already to have an emotion about it. Perception for Dewey is a phase of action. This is the transactional view where things are all kind of um, fluid. Right, so perception is a phase of the action, and even to recognize that something is a bear is already to have certain attitudes coming into play. It's to be put in a certain state of mind, as he's going to be using the phrase here. So an attitude for Dewey, and this is, uh, maybe a, um, could be a difficult word to understand, because um, we think of, about it as kind of uh, like a mental state, maybe. But an attitude for Dewey is a tendency to act. And Dewey thinks that an attitude is something that was once a complete act, but which has become reduced to just a tendency. So you start out with these complete uh, with these acts um, that are developed in order to interact with the environment, to change the environment or whatever, have an effect on the environment. And this is coming out of Darwin. Um, and then these over time can get reduced to just tendencies, a tendency to do something where you have be more behavioral flexibility in an organism. And so you get these attitudes, which are kind of the beginnings or the tendency to act, but not the whole act. Um, 
So these attitudes have what we call an emotional quality when we need to adjust them to some end. So they come to have an emotional feel, an emotional tone or quality. Uh, in his theory, the different emotional qualities depend on whether we're having success in adjusting towards some end, uh, whether we're failing, having failure, or whether we're just going under, uh, undergoing the effort of adjustment, you know, adjusting our attitudes towards the ends that we want to achieve, you know, getting ourselves into the right state in order to get what we want, achieve what we want. So for example, let's take an example to make this kind of abstract um, process a little more concrete. <clears throat> so for example, sudden is a kind of tape building on the classic example of seeing a bear. So for example, suddenly meeting a bear up close uh, might put us into a certain attitude or state of mind that we might call fearful. So imagine turning a corner, running into a big hairy beast that looks at you and begins growling at you. So the bear for you is not just a bear. Right? It's not just uh, a bear as a kind of ob neutral object, but it's a um, it's a threatening, scary object, a threatening, scary thing, a bear, right? So the, your, the perception of the bear as a threat, this perception of the bear that it's threatening to you, puts you in a certain state of mind. We might call this a fearful state of mind. Um, your body changes to prepare you for action. So it's not that you feel an emotion uh, per se, but you um, perceive the bear as a threat and that starts changing your body, get, uh, putting you in a certain attitude to respond to it. And when you feel this, that's kind of um, what we might call it the emotion that you feel, the emotional tone of the whole situation. Um, so your body changes, right? When you see, perceive the bear to prepare you for action, you have a certain end in view, which is maybe escaping the threatening bear. Uh, and there's changes to your body in, in response to this. So resp your respiration might change your circulation, your digestion, and so on. It's kind of this fear response or flight response, right? Which happens to prepare you towards the end that um, you're trying to attain. So the reverberation, the reverberation of these changes through your body is the feeling of the fear. Now, since the bear is a thing that can move, if you run away from it, your perception of it um, remains present because you know it might be chasing you. So you've got these two activities going up on at the same time, which need to be coordinate, coordinated. The activity of perceiving the threatening bear, the ongoing activity of perceiving the bear, and the ongoing activity of running away. And I'm not recommending that you run away from bears, but just the just the example, of course. Um, you know, consult your uh, forest ranger if you need tips on how to respond to bears. Uh, but anyway, these need to be these two different processes of perception and of perceiving the bear and running away. These two kinds of actions really uh, need to be fitted together and adjusted to each other with the possibility of success and failure. And this kind of uh, non-habitual situation is one in which intense emotion is likely to appear. If you habitually run away from bears, if it's something you do every day, the emotion becomes reduced or absent because uh, you know fitting your attitudes to the and actions becomes more automatic. Uh, but the important point is that the threatening bear and the fearful state of mind are just two descriptions of what is originally one thing. So there's a situation which has a certain emotional quality or emotional tone. And when we, re uh, when we reflect on what happened later, if we're telling the story later on or thinking about what happened later on, we can analyze the situation into various parts, such as the bear on the one hand and our the uh, a feeling of fear on the other, but originally this is all one thing, one situation that has a certain emotional quality. Um, so why do we analyze situations to bring out the objective and subjective factors? The object, um, the objects as objects, and um, yeah, so why do we uh, analyze the situation? Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Why do we analyze the situation to bring out these different uh, um, objective and subjective factors? So to bring them out uh, objects as objects, I suppose, and feelings as separate, uh, something separate from the object belonging to a subject, right? So we kind of divide the world into subjects and objects. Well, why do we do this? 
Well, we do this because we have an interest, you might say a survival interest in the uh, connection between cause and effect, or what Dewey says is agencies and consequences. We're interested in agencies and consequences, why things happen, what happens, because why. So I think we're interested in cause and effect because it helps us to adapt, kind of the Darwinian um, version of this. So if we can figure out the cause of something, we can predict when it will happen again and either avoid it if it's bad or cultivate it if it's good. Attributing states of mind to some things helps us deal with them better, but attributing states of mind to other things uh, does not help us deal with them. So uh, we like to say that, or I like to say that a bad workman blames his tools, a famous saying, um, or I also like the version that says a poor workman quarrels with his tools. That's a little bit, a little bit more animated. Um, but we come to make a distinction between subjects which, which have states of mind and objects which do not. So it's not very effective to blame your tools, of course, or to argue with your tools because they're not likely to respond by changing their behavior. Um, instead, the workman needs to manage his own behavior. He needs to turn to his own states of mind, analyze his own attitudes, right? His, uh, his states of mind are his um, tendencies to behave in certain ways. So if he wants to change his workmanship, he needs to look there, not necessarily to what his tools are doing, what he needs to analyze what he's going to do with his tools. Um, so it, it just works out better, right, to um, analyze these into subjects and objects. So the distinction between subjects who have states of mind and objects which do not have states of mind is made then for mainly social reasons, to help us get results that are socially desired or avoid results that are socially undesirable. At a certain stage of culture, uh, so Dewey mentions this, we praised objects for working well, or we punished ob objects for not cooperating, like the workman punishes his tools for not for uh, contributing to his bad workmanship. And alongside this, we treated someone who engaged in socially unacceptable behavior as kind of like something physically was wrong with them, as being like physically polluted, physically dirty. So we might make someone who did something wrong bathe. We might make them bathe or undergo some kind of purification ritual. But eventually we learned it was more um, efficacious to praise or punish people or sometimes animals. Um, to uh, punish or praise the you know the people or animals in the, this equation rather than the objects, and we learned that moral impurity is not like physical impurity as with impure water. Uh, to influence objects, on the other hand, we learned that we can discount what are called the secondary and tertiary qualities. So secondary qualities are things like uh, taste and color and smell, and tertiary qualities are things like the um, emotional qualities associated with objects. So if you need to control the movement of a stream for or a hunk of stone, for example, you don't need to worry about how they smell or how they make you feel. You need to deal with them in terms of things like mass and velocity and volume. These are what are called primary qualities. So the realm of uh, primary qualities is the realm of uh, natural science, engineering, things like that, secondary and tertiary qualities. Again, things like, um, you know, smell and taste and color or the emotional quality, the feeling of something, the associations of something, their tertiary qualities. Um, all these things are dealt with more within the human sciences and in the arts. So to control the behavior of agents like people and animals, as opposed to objects, we learn that we need to pay attention to their states of mind their tendencies to act in certain ways under certain conditions. Uh, in modern society, for example, you're taught to distinguish your states of mind, your emotions, in order to regulate your behavior. Society latches on to clues to our inchoate behaviors, our, um, just our you know, tendencies to behave, our, the beginnings of our behaviors, and tries to shape them to fit socially acceptable models. And it teaches us to observe our behavior in the same way. It teaches us to notice our tendencies to act in certain ways toward the world. And it teaches us to modify these tendencies in certain socially acceptable ways. So you learn to observe when you're you know, starting to get angry 
your um you start to learn to observe how your body feels in certain situations when things are not really going how you want them to go which uh, indicates that you're likely to do something destructive you start getting a certain feeling you're able to predict predict that if things keep going like this if you don't you know, kind of manage your behavior you're likely to um you know punch someone or smash something uh so we learn that when we start to feel these tendencies we learn to control them right to manage them rather than just acting follow then rather than just following the tendencies where they want to go into kind of a socially unacceptable way so dewey writes let me give you a quote from dewey on this topic he says uh, from the paper on um, on the top on this topic he says roundly speaking it is only because of social pressure and education that we ever recognize that we have any states of mind at all others insist in pointing out that we are angry and in reprobating us therefore and in treating us as beings who are composed out of anger as if it were for the time being the very stuff out of which our innermost souls are made thus in time though always in a more or less half-hearted and reluctant way we learn to regard ourselves as beings possessed of peculiarly private states. So through this social process of being told that we're uh, angry or happy or whatever, we learn to um, regard ourselves as having certain inner states, private states. And there's a number of influences on the rise of subjectivism, such as religion and the arts. I don't want to say too much about this here, but religion often demands a, you know, a search of the heart, an examination of your own attitudes toward the divine, towards your community. Art, too, has become a way to experience the play of states of mind outside of obviously social situations. So the art situation is kind of more private, more personal. You're focusing more on how you feel about some object. And all of this heightens our sense of having a private world of experience. All right. So to conclude, Dewey holds a version of the James Langa theory of emotions, in which emotion does not mediate between perceptions and actions, but is a part of perception and action. Right? We're likely to feel emotions when there is some difficulty or effort involved in fitting actions to ends right and choosing the right attitude and getting from attitudes and actions to um, the end that you want and dewey emphasizes that our experience of an inner world our distinguishing of the subjective from the objective is due mainly to social factors uh, so states of mind are not truly in the organism because they only come about when the organism is adjusting to an environment states of mind are part of this whole situation they're not just in the um, organism at least if you look at it in a broader sense but for purposes of control we tend to locate states of mind in the organism attributing states of mind to the weather right? if you attribute a state of mind to the weather or to the mountains doesn't really help us control them and predict what they're going to do while attributing states of mind to people does help us control them or be able to predict predict what they're going to do in daily life situations so describing the weather as cheerful or dismal won't help you predict what is going to happen later but describing a person as cheerful or depressed or whatever will help you predict what they are going to do, at least better than predicting the weather. All right, so that's all I want to talk to uh, talk about today. This was kind of uh, a difficult one for me because uh, Dewey's just hard to talk about. It's uh, one thing to read him, one of those people you kind of read and it makes sense while you're reading it. And then when you try to um, maybe internalize it, make it, you know, and become able to express it in your own way, it's really not so easy, but hopefully <laughs> that worked a little bit for some of you. And yeah, I do recommend struggling through Dewey if you want to understand uh, psychology, especially American psychology. But anyway, that's all for today. Thanks for listening and have a good one.